Well, grace and peace to all of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior who is Jesus the Christ. Amen. What we read in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke today, is part of a long proclamation Jesus made to the people in his last week in Jerusalem. Sitting by the temple complex, Jesus surprised the disciples with his prophecy that all these magnificent buildings, temple buildings that Herod had constructed, that all those huge gleaming white edifices that the disciples were transfixed and marveling at would all be thrown down, he said. One day, indeed just a few decades later, the temple would be utterly destroyed by the Roman Empire. Christ said, not one stone will be left upon the other. The disciples then followed Jesus across to their hangout, the Mount of Olives, where they could see the temple, they could still see the temple clearly. Even though they knew that the temple hierarchy was opposed to their Lord, the disciples were were, were obviously shocked at Christ's prediction. They figured that, well, when the temple was destroyed, surely the end of the world would come. So they, they said to him, tell us, Jesus, when this will be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? I imagine, based on Christ's reaction, that his disciples were approaching the end times a bit like Chicken Little. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. In Mark's version, Jesus told them to be aware that no one leads them astray with false prophecies of when the world will end. He said, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, Christ emphasized. The end is still to come. How often, even in my own short lifetime, have both religious and secular prognosticators jumped the gun and did their chicken little impersonations? Jesus had none of that. For nation, he said, will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, he pointed out. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. So you see, Jesus didn't want the disciples to become paralyzed. Or not only paralyzed with fear, but, or be panicked and do something stupid. Jesus no doubt feels the same way about us today. Now don't get me wrong. It is important to keep up with the news and look very closely at the facts in those news. Especially paying attention to those news facts that do not jibe with our treasured assumptions. But there's always an element in the media. Especially today on the internet and on social media. Tailored and made to cater to our assumptions that wants to sell advertising dollars by getting your attention. They know the best way to do that is to inflame your prejudices so that you will use your mouse, you know which one I'm talking about, to click on particular headlines. Some headlines won't even tell you what the article's about. Blank just dropped a bombshell, so you click. You wouldn't believe what so-and-so said about so-and-so. You'll be shocked when you hear what this famous person just said. Click. Alarming news about whatever. Click. Ten things you should be worried about in the year 2022. Click. <laughs> Jesus doesn't want us to ignore what's going around around us. Believe me, I'm not getting at that. But Christ wants us to hold on to our faith and to the mission and ministry that comes with that faith. It's Satan that wants us to test our faith, as he, just as he asked Christ, just as he tested Christ's faith in the wilderness. And one way that Satan does that is by trying to divert our attention, attention to our fears, to our fears which with, with which he will divert us away, away from sharing God's love with other people. Yes, Christ wants us to hold on to our faith, as we read in Luke today. Jesus proclaims, there will be on earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea or the roaring of the headlines, I might add. People will, Christ continues, faint from fear and from the foreboding of what is coming upon the world. Yeah, I see a lot of that. Not here at King of Glory so much, but I see a lot of people just acting like they're digging a hole to hide in. When they do that, they forfeit the life of service that comes with their salvation. They 
forfeit the wonderful things they get to do through helping others because they fear what they feel they've got to do to survive. It's no good to feel like Charlie Brown felt when he confided to Linus about his pervasive sense of inadequacy. You see, Linus, he Linus, he once said, it all goes the way back to my beginning. The moment I was born and set foot on the stage of life, they took one look at me on that stage and they said, not right for the part. Don't be like Charlie Brown. We need you a king of glory. We really do. As the Apostle Paul once wrote, now you are the body of Christ and you are individually members of that body. Individually. Each one of you. Now, don't believe those preachers who try to clothe Jesus Christ in their own gloom and doom robes. See where Jesus of Nazareth tells you today in our gospel to be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation. Dissipation, which is a fancy word for diverting your energies to activities that are not important. Do not be weighed down with dissipation and with drunkenness. Do not be weighed down with the worries of this life. Jesus does not want us to lay down on the job. He tells us today, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. That's why we have hope. And why on this first Sunday in Advent, we light the candle of hope. We hope in God. And God comes through. His redemption, as he just said, is drawing near. As Jeremiah prophesied for us today, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made. In those days, and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch, a righteous branch to spring up out of David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Sure enough, God sent his son Jesus to fulfill this promise. This Jesus has, been, has given us both salvation and his spirit. Both grace to come and life for now. That we may truly live as Christ's feet, hands, and voice today. Why? Well, as Jeremiah said, the Lord, the Lord is our righteousness. We Christians ultimately do not care what other standards are of being right. We put to the side even our own ideas of what is right. So that we may make the Lord Jesus our only standard of righteousness. We are here in our remaining years on this earth, you and I. Called simply to show Christ to other people. To give Christ's love to others. And to be Christ's presence in the lives of anyone who is made in the image and likeness of God their creator. Christ knows our weaknesses. Yours and mine. Christ knows how easily... We can get down on ourselves. We may think that we cannot lift up a world that is in constant flux and constant conflict. But I am reminded often of that story you may have heard of a man walking on a beach and coming upon a boy who was picking up and gently throwing things in the ocean. He asked the boy, what are you doing? The boy replied, throwing starfish back into the ocean. The surf is up and the tide is going out. If I don't throw them back, they will die. The man laughed. <laughs> and said, do you realize there are miles and miles of beach and hundreds and hundreds of starfish? What, do you, what you are doing right now will make no difference. The boy smiled, bent down. Picked up another starfish and as he threw it, he replied, made a difference to that one. The boy was alert, as we can be to the opportunities instead of the difficulties found in any situation. Whereas the Lord prayer, Lord's Prayer says, wherever God's kingdom can come and wherever God's will can be done at that moment. That's why Christ tells us today to be alert at all times to his call. He tells us today to be praying and thus listening to God. He tells us today to stand before the Son of Man and to receive that Son of Man's instructions. Those instructions may be to give a word of blessing 
or to do an act of kindness or be a vehicle of hope or to go above and beyond that minimum amount of graciousness that we are expected to show one another in society. But in any case, do not play Satan's game and give up. Or think you are not talented enough or energetic enough to be on God's team. I'm told there was one particular Sunday when the pastor was starting off that long prayer, you know, the prayer of the church that comes after the sermon. Suddenly, right in the middle of that long prayer, there was a loud whistle from someone in the... Can someone do a whistle? Who does a whistle? Thank you. Suddenly, there was a loud whistle from someone in the congregation. Well, it came from Gary, all of 10 years old at the time. Gary's mother was horrified at what her son had done. So after the service, she asked him, Gary, whatever made you do that? And Gary answered, I asked God to teach me to whistle. And you know, just then he did. <laughs> like with Gary, God will teach you. Ask God, ask God not for riches or for anything selfish, you understand, but ask God for a talent and God will give it. Ask God for a way to help someone else, and God will find for you a way to do just that. Ask God to tell you, in the midst of the best times, the worst times, or any time in between, what to say and do, or what not to say and do. God will come through for you. As Glenn MacDonald recently wrote, one of the most overlooked marks of real spiritual maturity is your declining need to label the circumstances of your lives. McDonald goes on. You know, when we no longer say what's happening to me is really good or, or what's happening to me is really bad, but rather say, God is at work in all of these circumstances no matter how I happen to judge them, then we've arrived at a place where we understand that God is ultimately in charge of our stories. No matter how they happen to look to us in the present moment, Right, Glenn. The ultimate importance of what Glenn McDonald points out here is not just becoming spiritually mature. You see, not getting caught up in whether presently we are going through good or bad times actually gives us the perfect opportunity to get out of ourselves and instead into the mode of activity of being God's tool, God's handiwork, an instrument in God's hands for helping others in that moment. Christ tells us today, be alert. Do not faint in fear. Do not be weighed down by worries the world suggests you have in this life. And instead, stand up, raise your heads, look to me. That's Christ calling you and me to our best life. Christ calling us to look out for others. Christ calling us not to take our eyes off the ministry ball but rather keep our eyes on the exciting, amazing, joyful life that is dedicated to God and dedicated to the world and its people. People, our wonderful God, so lovingly made. Amen.